Good morning everybody that's here um, on time. I think there's people still coming in at the moment. Um, it's good to see so many familiar names and some new people too. I think it's about time that we did an in real life event soon so that we can actually meet people in person would be quite nice. So I'll start thinking about that. Um, for those of you that haven't been to one of our webinars before, I'm Lisa and I head up the marketing and events at Torchbox. Um, and I love hosting these webinars and we've got an absolute cracker for you today because we have got Suzanne and Ellie who are product directors at Torchbox and they're going to be sharing their top tips for creating a strategic roadmap. Um, this webinar has come about because we hear frequent um, feedback on challenges that people are finding like their roadmap looks more like a list of features rather than a strategic plan or they can't get buy-in from skeptical managers and things like that so we thought hang on a minute this could make a really good webinar so that's why we're here today. Um, Ellie and Suzanne have got a huge amount of experience to draw on for the session. So Suzanne has led on digital strategy for charities including Cruise Bereavement Care, Mencap Pride, um, Young Minds and Drink Aware and she understands the challenges that non-profit organisations face and she's got a load of experience on how to overcome them as well. And we've got Ellie, who has experience across the non-profit and public sectors. And Ellie's excellent at bringing teams together and stakeholders so that everyone's on the, so the same page when you're trying to solve difficult problems and finds exciting ways to take advantage of new opportunities for digital products and services. So we're really lucky that they're both here today to share their expert knowledge and experience. Um, we'd love to hear your questions. Um, so if you can use the Q&A facility, it makes it easy for us to see which ones have been answered. Um, and it is a webinar, so you can see us, but we can't see you. But any other feedback or um, comments in the chat is always good for a bit of interaction as well. I am recording the session so that I can share it with you after. And I think that's about it from me. So I'm going to hand over to Ellie to kick things off. Fabulous. Thanks, Lisa. I'm just going to share my slides. There we go. So as Lisa has said, in this webinar, we're going to talk to you through an eight step approach to building a strategic roadmap. And you might quite reasonably be thinking, we've already got a roadmap. What's the difference between a roadmap and a strategic one? Um, and it's worth saying, you know, a good roadmap really helps everyone to visualize and work towards the same goals. And it can provide a sense of direction and really help motivate everyone because we all know then where we're going and why we're going there. But we know from experience that um, roadmaps can often become a bit more about the what and the how and possibly even the when. Um, and that these considerations can then start to feel a bit more pressing because they're more tangible in that pace of kind of day to day. So today, we're going to set out a model that will help you formulate a roadmap at the strategic level, so for a whole programme of work or a whole service area. And that's going to act as a really powerful framework for prioritising the things that your teams work on, understanding the different dependencies between all those areas of work, and making sure that your users are at the centre of everything that you do. And it will act as a kind of a great first step to align and inspire your teams before projects and deliverables get planned out and divided up. But it can also work really fantastically well for bringing people back together midway through a programme of work or really any time that you feel like you want to refresh on alignment or direction or purpose. So we think that this helps to solve a few problems that we hear and see quite often. Um, and some of these might be kind of familiar to you. So we're going to stick a poll up in a second for you to kind of pick any that you recognise from this list um, and add any others that you've got into the chat. So we've pulled out things like, you know, there are lots of projects running in parallel and that can be really hard to manage. And then you find that you start to duplicate effort or you get in each other's way um, and you're all waiting for the same dependencies. And maybe your stakeholders or your team start to say, look, we're not making any progress. This is really like grinding us down. Um, and all the time, those pressing priorities are getting worse and worse. So I'm just looking at the responses coming in. It looks like lots of these are resonating. But folks, oh, we've got some, got some clear leaders showing up. So it looks like having lots of projects running in parallel is starting to stick out mm. um which is definitely one that we see a lot i think it can be really easy to um 
you know, start lots of things and feel like you're making lots of progress, but quite quickly you can get a bit kind of tangled up. So I think we're nearly there with everyone. So there we go. So multiple projects is sticking out as a bit of a clear leader, but also that that inability to see what progress you're making and be confident that you are kind of moving towards some goals. So that's super, super helpful. Um, and if you're thinking, I'm not sure if I've got any of those problems, um, what you might notice um, is that some of these symptoms of those problems are starting to show, so some early signs. Um, and these are kind of manifestations of a general frustration really around impact or decision making or direction. And they, they pop up day to day, um, and particularly I think lots of meetings that don't feel like they're going anywhere and lots and lots of conversations about risk. Everyone is worried about risk. Um, and that can lead to really difficult stakeholder conversations and lots of pulls in focus as we try and jump to the thing that feels riskiest at the next time. And that can be really difficult for your team um, and for the value that you're trying to deliver to your users because you're constantly moving around. So a strategic roadmap um, can help with all of these things. So that's the good news. Um, and through this um, session, we're gonna build up towards something that looks a little bit like this. So here are eight steps, which we'll talk through shortly, and you'll build up a picture that ends up being a roadmap that you can then use around your organization. And we'll, um, we'll kind of share it as, a way to kind of facilitate the conversation and end up with this output um, and produce a roadmap that you can start using right away that helps to bring together all the perspectives and conversations that you're having around the organization into an aligned and agreed set of priorities and objectives and that's really important. Um, we've learned that the most successful roadmaps are the ones that are put together in this collaborative way because whilst you can put together a plan on your own or in a small group it tends to leave you with quite a lot of work to do to get the support and the buy-in that you need at the outset and throughout um, to do the work that you've planned. And it can mean that your roadmap quite quickly becomes irrelevant because it can't keep up with those shifting priorities and those misaligned dependencies. Um, this, this approach is really about creating an opportunity for your stakeholders and teams to understand each other's perspectives. And that means that you can then come together and find one way forward that is the best for your organization and your users. So it is worth kind of prioritizing bringing in even those slightly tricky vocal stakeholders that you might have into this session to get it all out and formulate it into a plan. Um, and if you can set yourself somewhere to capture content ahead of time, it me makes it easier to kind of have the conversation as an open and sort of natural organic conversation, but you can capture things as you go. We often use Miro for this, as I've just shown you, but a spreadsheet with a row for each of the steps can work just as well. The main thing is that you can store it and access it easily, and so can the people that you work with. Um, we tend to find that the, take the session takes about two hours, um, if you can have someone to help you with notes, that can really help. Um, and, you know, build in things like a break partway through so that you can have a bit of a breather if the conversation starts to get a bit difficult. Um, and a car park for things that come up, but they're not really directly relevant, but you want to be able to come back to them later and you want to be able to show your participants that they've been heard. So now that we've got our kind of building blocks set up, Suzanne is going to kick us off with the first step. Thank you, Ellie. Um, step one in aligning everyone is a clear vision for success, something we can all understand and describe. It should provide direction and momentum. Um, it can be helpful to ask people to think about this in terms of six month, 12 month and 18 month horizons. That tends to help keep it grounded. Um, it's a really simple question, but we find it can be a real challenge to answer, particularly if you're struggling to find agreement and alignment in the team about priorities. It also can encourage people to jump to solutions. Success, for example, is the delivery of a new self-help tool or a system integration. So instead, we find this question can be a bit more illuminating. What are the problems now? Uh, tends to be something people feel more confident to articulate. It also allows and invites a range of perspectives and experiences. 
Um, it might sound like a negative way to start, but it's a really good to focus people on the problems we're trying to solve. It, it can be cathartic, um, but it can also be very motivating, particularly when the problems we're solving will uh, benefit our beneficiaries or supporters. So this is an example of a road mapping exercise looking at volunteer recruitment and onboarding. Um, it's an example which may resonate for anyone from a charity here that recruits and manages volunteers, but I'm sure everyone has their own version of this. Um, what we can see here is what are the problems now invites a range of perspectives and experiences. And this is particularly helpful when you're trying to diagnose and treat a fairly complex service or supporter issue, which probably impacts on multiple areas of your organization. In this instance, we can see that volunteer recruitment and onboarding impacts on operational staff who are spending a lot of time screening unsuitable volunteers. Training capacity is being stretched owing to retention issues and fundraising and income teams are frustrated that there's a missed opportunity for engagement. The presenting issue is that we can't fill the roles, uh, which might lead us to think that we need more volunteer applications. When we dig a bit deeper, though, we find that retention and engagement are part of the picture, which might lead us to reframe the issue as one about attracting suitable candidates rather than more candidates. If a problem is a missed opportunity, a frustration or a lack of satisfaction, then the success is simply the change we want to see or the benefit we want to experience. At this stage in the conversation, try and stay away as much as possible from naming specific solutions or technologies. Uh, focus on the outcomes you want to achieve. It's very likely that there are multiple ways um, to achieve it, and those will be influenced by a lot of other factors. Um, Often we find as well that once people have become attached to a particular solution or put a name on it, it's quite hard to shift them away from that. So in this example, if the problem is we spend a lot of time screening unsuitable prospective volunteers, our success is that eligible candidates apply and a higher proportion of applicants are approved. Um, our online form has increased access and encouraged more applications, but it's introduced this operational issue for volunteer managers who are now screening more unsuitable candidates. Um, there's many ways that we might solve this and achieve the success. This might be by adding more steps to the registration process and increasing friction. Uh, this is an approach we use with the Samaritans and it worked really well. Um, but equally, when I was at Cruise Bereavement Support, we took the approach of introducing pre-screening online information sessions that you had to attend before submitting your application. So at this point, we don't need to fix on a solution. We're just defining success measures. What makes a good success measure? Um, I think it's about describing the full journey and linking it to an outcome. We find that the so that format is really useful here. It's not necessary at this point to set any targets that can come later, and those are likely to shift and adapt. And again, at this point, we don't need to name solutions or technologies. So having explored the problems, the team by this point have hopefully reached some consensus about what success looks like. And this gives everyone a clear thing to aim for before they go on to step two. How will you know when you've achieved it? This is where we start thinking about what we might want to measure. And this matters because we want to be accountable and know if what we're doing is working and is right. It also matters because we want to demonstrate our impact to stakeholders, funders, and our beneficiaries. Um, but we also might want to learn and this uh, measuring what we're doing may indicate to us when we need to change our approach. I think there's always a concern that our feet will be held to the fire over targets and measurements, and it can encourage us to be a bit cautious and not want to overcommit. Um, I think at this stage, it's about giving the team permission uh, to be ambitious in the knowledge that they will review these targets and reset where necessary. We have an example here returning to our volunteers. Uh, how might we measure the success? of uh, eligibility criteria being understood and a higher proportion of applications being approved. Some of these are quantitative measures um, that we'll be able to see through our data. Fewer volunteers, prospective volunteers are rejected. 
And some of them will be qualitative measures like prospective volunteers understand suitability criteria. Um, so we'll typically always be looking at a mix of data and um, qualitative insight um, to measure our to measure these things. One of the things to watch out for during this part of the session is that it's easy to default to activity as a measure of success. We delivered the new form or campaign or tool, but that doesn't tell us whether we delivered any value. If you spot these types of measurements creeping in, try and go back to the problem statements and ask people to reframe them in terms of value. Another question, are we measuring the easy thing or the right thing? It's usually worth applying a bit of scrutiny to any measurements. Do these really link to our goals and objectives? Bringing it back to the volunteer example, it will be easy to measure volume of applications and probably show an increase, um, but our success is related to the quality of applications. That's undeniably more complex to measure, but a lot more useful in this scenario. I think we're often in stakeholder situations where big numbers and showing growth seem desirable, uh, which is why it's really important to get alignment on these success measures before we look at measurement so we understand what is meaningful. Step three, who are the users? I think we would all agree that to be confident that digital is helping us improve the lives of our audiences, we first need to know them and understand their challenges. Whose problems are we helping to solve and what do we really know about those problems? I'm sure we're preaching to the converted here that getting things right for your users is the simplest and strongest way to improve your outcomes. Who are your users or who is the target audience is one of the conversations that comes up pretty early in any project conversation. Um, but it's a challenging question. And we see often a sense that organizations feel they should know their users better. Um, what they have are fragments of insight and anecdote, but perhaps not a clear picture. Um, and we just wanted to do a quick poll now to ask everyone here how confident they feel about knowing their users. One being, I don't know them at all. And five being, I'm confident that I understand who they are, their motivations, behaviors, and the problems we're trying to solve for them. Let's see as those come in. Ellie, can you see the results as they come in? I can't. I can, yeah, I'm seeing them coming in. We're sort of grouping around the middle. So I think we're um, either side of three at the moment. So we've got some twos okay. and threes and fours. We haven't got anyone saying I'm really confident at five and we equally haven't got yeah. anyone saying I don't know them at all. Yeah, okay. and that I think that resonates with what we hear from clients and what we've probably experienced ourselves when we've been client side. Mm -hmm. Great. So, okay. So it looks like we've got some threes. We've got highest group of threes, um, quite a lot of fours, which is great. And some twos. Okay. Good. If we take again, the example of the new volunteer, I think this probably reflects what we've heard in the, in the numbers you've given us there. We'll usually have some data and some insight internally. Um, but we may find we've got some unanswered questions and missing puzzle pieces. And this is where you can explore whether the project perhaps needs some user research and additional stakeholder input. Some of this missing information will be more critical than others. And um, what's the risk in not knowing and how would it impact our ability to design for this audience? I think it's also worth digging a bit deeper into the age and origin of any insights whilst you've got this stakeholder group together. As an example of that, when I was at Cruise, um, within the services team, there was an understanding that people were being referred um, to the charity by their GPs to local services, and they were typically given a phone number. And whilst that certainly used to be the case, it was no longer the behaviour. And instead, people were being directed to the website by primary healthcare practitioners, which is why we were getting far fewer calls to local branches and far more inquiries for support through the website. And it was really important to shift that understanding before we were able to design the client pathway. So it's really good to unpack some of these unknowns, which Ellie's gonna talk more about in a moment. Um, top tip, 
is being descriptive. Roles are very important when designing systems, but it's also helpful to drill down into more descriptive language around needs, behaviors, and motivations and contexts. And Ellie's going to give us an example from her own experience. Yeah, so when I was working with the National Lottery Heritage Fund, we tended to talk about our users in terms of being applicants or grantees or staff members. Um, and at a high level, that was fine. Um, but when it came to things like devising new guidance or redesigning application forms, we needed to know actually a little bit more about these users um, and think about things like, are they applying for the very first time? Are they applying on behalf of a really big organization with a fundraising team, or are they part of a small community organization that they volunteer for part time? Um, are they part of a priority group? How much money are they applying for? Is it a thousand pounds or a million pounds? And what kind of project is it? Because all of those things affect the information that we need to give them and the information that we would need from them. So we needed to start unpacking a bit more about who our users really were and what context they were bringing or that we could assume they were bringing to the service. Another reason to speak to users and often is to make sure that we're understanding the data correctly and not leaping to conclusions. Analytics data might tell us what is happening, but it can't tell us why. We need other methods to understand behavior and thinking behind, behind it. You know, for example, we might conclude from a 30% dropout rate um, in the application process that a form is difficult to use. Well, actually, we find when talking to people that the eligibility criteria is not easily understood by people that don't know us. This insight then gives us something that we can act on. So hopefully, oh, sorry, missed a slide there. Um, whether it's through panels or seeking feedback by social media, just try and make this a core cool part of your process. Speaking to people regularly, even through informal channels, is, is far better than not including them in the process and not having the conversation. Um, returning to our volunteer example, hopefully collectively everyone at this point in the session feels like they have a better understanding of our users um, and any sort of unknowns are clearly flagged. Um, we may then decide to use this information further down the line to manage the scope of the project, but we'll come on to that in a bit. And uh, I'm going to hand back over to Ellie now. Yes, this is my this is my favourite step, actually. Um, what do we want to learn? Because um, we've talked about who our users are and now we need to think about what is it that we need to know about them? What do we need to know about their experience or their knowledge or their needs and their preferences? So. Checking in with those definitions and measures of success that we defined earlier, we might think about what do we need to learn or prove to be able to achieve those? If we're aiming to grow our volunteer base, do we know enough about what makes someone choose to volunteer or choose to stop volunteering? So we're trying to establish the level of existing knowledge and our confidence that we understand the problem that we're focused on. Um, and also build up a bit of a backlog of research and analysis that we need to do before we have enough confidence to move on to the next step. And it also can really help engage your stakeholders by giving them a space to hear out any concerns or assumptions and for them to bring their subject matter expertise to the table. So trying to have this as a kind of open set part of the session, a really conversational discussion, will make this as broad as possible. Um, and assume ahead of time that you are likely to get a few technical and logistical questions here that you can kind of filter out um, for your project manager to pick up or for your, yourself to pick up separately. But you don't want to miss the chance to capture the broadest possible range of questions here since they might end up being really key to your plans and delivery. Um, so a few times on this. Um, at this section, I've had people kind of mention, well, I don't know if I'm full time on this project, so I don't know how much I can commit to, or I'm not sure if I'm going to get pulled onto this other thing. Those are questions it's important to know for your plan, but it's not something that you need to ask your users about. So don't worry too much about the structure at this session. Just try and scoop everything up and you can filter through it later. This tends to be quite a chunky session part of the session. Um, and it's worth spending the time here because this is where you're building confidence 
across your team, but you're also building that shared understanding of actually what are the things that we don't know and what are the things that we're excited to learn about. And you start to kind of lay the foundations that this is a process of continual learning. You will probably need to prompt your participants in a few different ways to get all of their questions and concerns out. Um, and doing that helps to draw out early those kind of what about questions that can really derail things later. So bear in mind that as the facilitator, you have a little bit of extra license to kind of ask probing or clarifying questions here because you're there for the benefit of everyone attending to get that alignment and that shared understanding. So if you feel like someone has asserted something as a fact, but you're not sure there's evidence, you can kind of revisit that here um, and pull it out and say, do we need to look into that? So perhaps, you know, we're saying our primary users are highly digitally confident. I wonder if that's something that we've got evidence for, or is it something that we should consider in research? And don't be afraid to kind of move things around um, and pop things in this section as you go through the rest of the session when questions inevitably crop up. So after this lengthy discussion, you should end up with a bit of a sense of some questions that you're going to explore. And they don't need to be formulated, you know, ready straight to go into user research. They might just be areas that you want to understand more about. So if we're thinking about our volunteer example, do we know what the hurdles are that people are encountering when they are registering? Do we know the things that they are thinking about and weighing up when they're choosing to volunteer? Do we know what information they're looking for and where they're getting it from? Um, and things like that, just so we start to build up that picture so that we can achieve the goals that we've set out. Next for step five is what do we want people to know about this work? Um, and this is really important because I imagine lots of us on the call know about great work that we've done or that other people have done that hasn't quite landed the way that it was intended to. Maybe people are worried about the process we followed to get there or who was involved. Um, and in a past role, I led a team who were rolling out a new case management system to a UK wide workforce. And throughout that project, we worked really hard to communicate often about our work with all of the internal staff who would be affected by the change. We did week notes, we did show and tell sessions, and we recorded those and shared them widely. But we hadn't spent enough time understanding where our colleagues were before we started. And we didn't fully understand the level of trust that they had in the way that the organisation consulted staff and the way that they delivered projects. And that had a really big impact on our comms that we hadn't fully expected. So there were lots of people who didn't engage. Um, and we did find ways in that project to bring more people into the conversation and improve this over time. But I think if we'd factored it into our plans from the outset, our first release would probably have had much more of the positive response that it, it deserved and the team certainly deserved. And we would have had a less work to do afterwards to build that staff engagement and trust back up. So how and when you communicate about your work is critical to its success. And thinking from the outset about what you might want your colleagues and your peers and your users to know is a really great way to build engagement early. And it can help to recruit your research participants and build networks to share and reuse related work with other peer organisations who are doing or have done the same kind of things. And that can save you time and effort and money because you can share those learnings. So think of this as another great exercise in understanding your user. Do you have a clear sense of what matters most to the people that you're communicating with? Do you know why you're communicating with them? Is it because you want to prepare them for change? Or do you want them to take some action, get involved or send you feedback? Or are you responding to feedback they've previously given you? So I always like to think of this as, you know, every to-do list I've ever had on a project has had somewhere in it write a comms plan. Um, and in lots of those projects, it has dropped steadily down the priorities. But the likelihood is that you will have people who want to be engaged in the project and who want to know what's happening and what's changing because you're product or service matters to them. So thinking up front about what you'd like them to know or what you'd like them to do is a really good way of planning ahead and building that into your project. And you can also at this point kind of consider anything that you can't share up front and your stakeholders will likely have things about this that they want to say. There might be some commercially sensitive information if you're in the mid middle of procuring a new system. 
There might be insights that you've gathered from vulnerable users or people who haven't given their consent for you to share it widely. So those are considerations to bear in mind here too. And what you'll end up with from in terms of the roadmap is probably not a fully fledged comms plan, but it should bring you some nice um, plain language messages that should be understandable to anyone at all about what you want people to take away about your project. So coming back to our volunteer um, example, we want to make it easy to volunteer with us. That's the thing that we want everyone to know. Um, we want to hear from you about volunteering. That's encouraging that feedback and that engagement. We want people to know that we're acting on things so we've got plans and they're exciting. And we want people to know that these are relevant to them locally. So we're working in these areas or these communities. And that gives you some clear themes and some core messages that you can focus on throughout your communications so that you aren't overwhelming people with every possible thing you could tell them about your project and all the nuts and bolts that you've touched that week. But you're establishing a kind of repeating set of themes and building some trust and understanding in the work that you're doing. The next one um, is what do we think we know or what assumptions do we have? Um, and agile and user-centered projects often tend to hinge on risk levels and confidence levels. So how high is the risk if we're wrong about something? And how confident are we that we're right? Maybe we've got some evidence or some insight from users. And assumptions are part of that balance. They're not always wrong, um, and it is entirely normal and expected that most of the people in the room will have brought some assumptions with them. And they can actually really helpfully direct your research and your technical discovery work and help you mitigate risks nice and early. And there might be some things that you can kind of call out as assumptions, but acknowledge that they are low impact if you're wrong, um, and they're low enough risk that you're going to have them as working assumptions. And it helps to think about this as that kind of what are our risks and you know what are our priorities for investigation. Um, so to kind of bring this one home, I once um, worked on a discovery for a big organization and they registered owners of a particular device. And so they were starting a project to build an online registration service because they wanted more people and particularly more big organizations to register their devices with them. But they'd made a really big assumption and a really big gamble that online registration would be a major enabler of registration and it would drastically change their numbers. But they hadn't really explored the factors that were actually determining those users' behaviour. So they weren't thinking about what made people choose to register with them over a competitor. Um, and we found that actually it wasn't anything to do with registration at all. It was to do with the different costs and benefits that were associated with registering with one provider over another. And by surfacing that right at the start, we could refocus the work and we could test that assumption early and find out what would influence that registration decision and focus our efforts there instead, rather than spending several months designing an online registration service that wouldn't have had the impact it needed to. So you will probably have gathered some of these through the earlier discussion. It might be that someone has said, we don't need to learn about that, we already know about it, and you're not totally sure, but you pop it here. Um, it might be that, you know, things have cropped up where you think, oh, I'm not sure we've got evidence for that, or it, it might be sort of layered into some things that get discussed. So you will probably have two or three things here already. And when you get to this step, it's good to kind of check in with that and say, I've popped this here because it sounded like we didn't have evidence for it and we should explore it further. Um, and that is an, a good space for your participants to say, oh, actually, I do have some evidence for this. I'm happy to share it. Or I got that from here. Or I know of another project, actually, that's looking at that. And then you can think about how you want to work with that. Um, and it helps to break the ice a bit and kind of show, look, there are assumptions here. They're not dragons. It's fine. We can talk about this. Um, and then you can start to have these really good conversations about what you're going to do next and any other kind of assumptions that there are. So you should end up with a few things. Um, um, you know, there will be a mixture of really big assumptions, like we've assumed that we will find out about stuff that we have the power to change. Um, there's not, not much you can do about that assumption, but you can call it out. 
but looking at these other ones you know if we're wrong about the form being the reason that people abandon registration we could spend lots of time and lots of effort improving our form and not see that result in any change in our measures of success if we're wrong about awareness you know people knowing about our volunteering opportunities being important we might spend lots of money on marketing and again not see that convert into any meaningful change and if we're wrong about our opportunities being inclusive we might find that even if we improve our form and we do lots of marketing and everyone's aware of our great opportunities we are still only capturing a narrow section of our target audience um, and we might actually have made the situation situation slightly worse by you know, excluding more proactively because we are pushing lots of energy towards that same narrow group. So it tells us where we actually need to find some more things out and it might likely, you know, pull out some more things that you need to learn about. So you add those up to your learning section. I think the thing to call out is that making assumptions is natural and human and so as facilitator you want to try and create space for people to talk about these without feeling like they need to defend them so try asking a few different questions to open it up a bit things like what do you think we'll find out when we look at the data or when we do the research what hunches have you got um because particularly when people have worked in an area for a long time it's you know they're bound to have some hunches about what you're going to find out once you've got a few, you can review them together and think about what's the risk if we're wrong about this? How can we test this early so that we reduce that risk straight away? And this can also help when you get to prioritisation, because you can make sure that you're working on those riskiest assumptions first, getting those out of the way and immediately kind of dialing down the risk level on your project as a whole. Suzanne, dependencies. Dependencies. As you've gone through steps one to six with your stakeholders, you will have started to pull out dependencies and they might be related to systems or technology or people or research, or they might be time based. Something can only launch after something else is launched. Um, but check in at this stage and focus everyone back on this um, to explore whether there are any other dependencies potentially lurking. And once you've captured them all, explore them in a bit more detail. Who controls them and who is accountable for that? Can we influence them? Um, most importantly, which ones have the potential to derail this project and how can we manage that risk? At this point, it's about moving them from things that feel like constraints to things that we can actively manage as part of the project. It's another way of surfacing risk, um, but it can also help with the overall program management. If you identify that your top priority has a dependency on a less important project that's already underway, could you pause that or accelerate it to manage the dependency? And can you put mitigating strategies in place um, so you can work in parallel, which is something that we've heard from you at the beginning is, a, is an issue. Um, what I would say also at this point is, don't be afraid to get granular. This tends not to be the bit of the project that stakeholders are most enthusiastic about um, because dependencies feel like blockers and it feels like resistance to change. Um, there can be a desire to gloss over them um, and that makes it even more important to explore them. So make sure um, that you keep everyone focused on this bit and spend enough time on it which takes us on to really the key dependencies, um, which are what people, skills and things do we need? Um, the conversation up to this point might have assumed a need for additional or different skills, people or things than the ones you've planned. Um, identifying this early on helps you decide how to manage that, whether you can get the things you need or recruit the skills you need and whether you need to do that before work starts. Perhaps you've planned to get started with building something right away, but you've realized there's some research and data analysis to do before that can happen. Or perhaps you've identified that your key user groups have access or digital confidence needs. So you need an accessible lab for research or use recruitment and research methods that can reach people offline. Discussions about budget and resources, particularly if you suspect you might need more, um, can be really difficult. I think we've all been in situations where we've inherited a budget or given a budget that might feel a bit arbitrary and we need to make a business case for additional people and skills. Um, 
collaborating with stakeholders on this and thinking about the people, time, capabilities and budget we need in relation to the success measures lets them see the whole picture and the impact that a lack of insight or a particular skill might have on overall project success. It's also can be a good opportunity to think about return on investment and what's likely to make the most difference either in social or financial terms. There will always be trade-offs, obviously, in any project situation. Budgets and capacity are not infinite. Um, through this process, we can help stakeholders make decisions and set priorities by connecting the resources you need to achieve the objectives and key results you set together. This is an opportunity to be really clear about any concerns you have relating to feasibility and sustainability. So aim to leave the session with a shared understanding of what is achievable with the available people, time, capabilities and budget. And on that note, I'm going to hand back over to Ellie to talk about prioritisation. Prioritisation, yes. So prioritisation is tricky, we'll be honest. Um, it takes a strong will. Um, it may even require some ruthlessness. Um, but once you've filled up your roadmap, you can start to use it to make some of those big decisions about strategic priorities, team shape and size, budgets, dependencies, and all of those things. Before we can do that, we need to prioritise. And this is where we can start to think and talk about how the objectives and ideas that we've captured can inform the structure and sequencing of a programme of work. So prioritising effectively helps set some expectations that will preserve your ability to deliver and your team's health throughout the whole program because you'll be able to clearly show that you have just one top priority at any given time and you'll involve your stakeholders now in deciding what that is. So I'm just going to cut over to Mira because I know this isn't the most legible um, but what you can do before you start prioritizing you can look for areas of commonality in the things that you've already added. So are there problems that are related to each other? Are there objectives that are related to each other? Can you see collections of work that are focused on a particular user group? Um, or are there things that have one particular shared dependency? Grouping those together can help you to spot kind of pragmatic and natural phases that will help keep your work focused and clear and make it easier to navigate dependencies and to phase things like research so that you're learning as you go while still making that steady forward progress. So in this example, although our focus is on volunteering, we can see that there are kind of different groups of focus around attracting more volunteers and engaging the volunteers that we have in our work longer term. So if we start to group the related objectives and the key results for those, we can start to see a kind of sensible phasing emerge. And that means that we can bring the things we learn about volunteers from the first focus, um, where we're looking at, we want more volunteers um, and we want more volunteers to complete the process. So these are all about growing our volunteer pool. Um, and then we can shift in the second phase to volunteer engagement. So can we engage our volunteers more closely in our work? Um, and then we can think after that about wider engagement. Can we engage our volunteers all the time, even when they're not volunteering? Um, and can we engage people who aren't aware of our volunteering opportunities in our work and make that into some sort of virtuous cycle? Um, I will just, I'm just gonna cut to questions briefly. Um, I think we can pick those up at the end. I just wanted to check there weren't any about the Miro board before I switch back. So prioritization is all about, again, facilitating those right conversations and being aware that each of your stakeholders will have brought their own priorities to the session. But hopefully by this point, you will have built up some more shared understanding of the different perspectives and the other priorities that are in kind of competition. And you can facilitate a more valuable discussion about the relative priority of all of the things that you've talked about. This can still be difficult um, because people naturally want to avoid conflict. Um, and it's quite rare in these sessions that you don't have someone suggesting that both of these things are top priority because we can't decide which should which should be top. But the reality is, if you have multiple things as top priority, you don't have any things as top priority. So thinking about those related groups, you can kind of 
help inform decision making. But if your group is really struggling, then you can try relative prioritization. Um, and I, because I grew up in the 90s, I like to think of this as Bruce's Price is Right. So you can pick the objectives that just happen to be first and second in your list and talk about of these two, which one is more important. And that kind of gets the ball rolling, that gets you started. And then you can carry on working through the list until everything has been shuffled up or down into a prioritized list. And that helps um, just break the task down a little bit so it's not as overwhelming as trying to prioritize a whole program in one go. When you're doing this, try and prompt your users to think, your participants to think about your users. So what's the impact on them? What's the value for the organization and the current situation? Just to draw them out of whatever kind of departmental or organizational context they've brought with them. Um, and that way you can talk about each priority individually and you can think about their relationships to each other and to your dependencies. And this can be really helpful later when an inevitable new um, priority emerges. Um, you know, we live in a world of global pandemics and cost of living crises, like things, things happen. So with this model, you can kind of follow that prioritization again and say this new thing, where does it fit and what needs to bump down to bring this in? And you can surface all of the trade offs that go with that really simply. Um, this is something that I like to do. Remember the burrito. Um, this is from a medium post um, written by someone, not me. But I like to think of prioritization in terms of slices because you want your initial scope to be minimal, but you also need it to be viable and desirable. Um, some folks like to talk about the minimum lovable product and that works too. Um, and what I think this lovely image of a burrito teaches us is that if we slice in the wrong direction, we can end up with something that isn't very nice. It's just a slice of lettuce. Um, but if we slice in the right direction, we can have a little bit of everything and we can have something that feels complete, even if it's narrow. And it's easy to end up with the wrong kind of slice if you have an activity or an output as your goal. So if it's launch new CRM or rebrand website, because that doesn't have a clearly articulated purpose or a value, there aren't clear users, there aren't clear needs, and there are lots of big and unknown assumptions and lots and lots of dependencies, you won't know when you're finished. So you'll end up with something that's not very valuable, not very lovable, and perhaps worst of all, once you've worked your way through a solid slice of lettuce, you've got a solid slice of cheese next. So you, you make the work feel much harder and you make the path to value lots, lots longer. So by thinking about your, your roadmap in terms of what's the, best combination of things that we can do, that we can achieve, that still feels like a complete step forward. That can really help with thinking about have we got this prioritization right? And is there something that is like a bonus extra, like the coriander or cilantro in this example, that we can, we can lose and it still feels like a complete thing. And lastly, and most perhaps most importantly, I'm going to hand over to Suzanne to talk about sharing your roadmap. Yeah, you've done all this work. You've got all the stakeholders together. Um, share it. And we would recommend sharing it as a living document um, with all the things you're going to learn and prove as you go through the project. You're bound to need to change um, some of the objectives over time or adjust the prioritization. So revisit it regularly. Uh, do it openly, so as that helps people to have trust in your work and the product that you're delivering. Show research participants how their input and influence has been heard. Um, and finally, just to conclude on, whilst it's always challenging to get stakeholders in a room together, it's usually worth the effort. So, um, so yeah, do, do persist with those diaries. Amazing. Thank you so much, Suzanne and Ellie. That was great. And I love the burrito metaphor as well. <laughs> it's a really nice image. Um, we do have a couple of questions and we've just got five minutes left, so if we could answer some of those. So the first one is, um, do you have recommended timings, etc., for each section of the workshop? 
Yeah, so I've run this a few different times. Um, you, uh, usually sort of 90 minutes to two hours feels like a good amount of time. Two hours is best if you can. Um, and rather than trying to time strictly each section, what I tend to do is aim for the learn or prove section to be somewhere around the middle and around the break. Because what tends to happen is that that's a real flurry of activity um, and people kind of get loads out and then it's good to have a break in the middle. So try and make it so that the first four fit in the first hour and the second four will fit quite comfortably in the last hour and leave you some, some room um, to have discussion and questions about things like prioritisation. Brilliant. Thank you, Ellie. Um, and then we've got a question on, um, I'm struggling to imagine what it looks like once you have answered those questions, or is it just the Miro board with the answers in it? It is just the Miro board. Um, so this is, you'll kind of populate this as you go, or your spreadsheet with, this is your kind of row headings. The real value, as well as, you know, the kind of documented bits and pieces, is the conversation that you're all having together. Um, so yeah, it's just this. And then um, that can we, can I can we, share it all. Can we share this Miro with everybody as well as the slides? Yeah, it's fine. Um, yeah. And I've got two good questions from Isabel as well. So the first one is, how would you run a roadmap session for an organisation with a diverse portfolio of activities and audiences? Um, that describes most charities, doesn't it? Um, diverse portfolio. Um, I think you can start with this roadmap to look at the full portfolio of services and audiences. And then it is probably about breaking that down into particular user groups or particular bits of service design. Um, but certainly as a starting point, and I have run this across looking at as a way of surfacing all the audience groups we've got, all the information we've got, and everything. So I don't think there's a necessarily a barrier to doing it across a range of services and users, although it will be a very big Miro by the end of it. A mammoth Miro. Yeah. Um, and also Isabel asks, um, at what point would you involve technical, the technical team or developers? So I would involve them in this exercise. I think bringing the technical team and the stakeholders together is really, really valuable. Um, they can hear each other's perspectives, they can have conversation about what's feasible, um, but also they can build a bit more understanding of each other. And it gives you slightly less work to do longer term, to kind of trying to translate between those two groups. It will bring them a little bit closer together. So I would really encourage you to bring them into those sessions. So as well as technical people, how do you establish who needs to be involved in this at the start? I think it can be a bit tricky um, to figure out who can be involved, but I think you will probably have a good sense of the team that are going to be involved in delivering the work and the stakeholders who have made noises about it. So you will have a sense of who in your organisation has either a stake in this or a really strong opinion about it um, and some degree of influence over it. Yeah. And I would say, if in doubt, bring them into the session. Um, because it's it's worth making this discussion useful and valuable. Just don't invite everyone because you'll have yourself a facilitation nightmare. Yeah, you, I think it's that getting like the um, burrito, it's sort of getting the right slice. You're trying to get a range of perspectives into the room. Some of those will be operational and um, people, you know, that have insights from working on the front line with your beneficiaries, uh, people that work with your supporters. So it's about getting a range of views. But as Ellie says, not creating a facilitation nightmare, um, you know, so. Um, so, yes, a range. All right, brilliant, thank you. Um, oh, we've got one more from Finbar. Um, he, he, Finbar joined us a little bit late, so if you've already answered this, then he apologises, but it's no palm and re-going over things anyway. Is there a point during the process where you reflect or question what you're doing, if what you're doing will help the charity achieve its objectives? For example, it would be a good idea to do X because it solves a problem, but it won't get us closer to where we want to be. I think so. I've I've run this in the past when we've had um, so at the National Lottery Heritage Fund, we got a new corporate strategy shortly after we'd kind of done our initial roadmap. So we revisited, and we um, I basically slightly pre-populated this format 
with those overarching kind of strategic objectives for the organization. And then we talked about what stops us hitting these right now. So we kind of framed the problem in terms of those big strategic objectives. So what stops us doing this right now? Um, and how will we know when we're doing this? And I think you can still kind of have that conversation, but you can just layer on that structure if it's going to help you to make sure that you're doing things that are contributing to those values that you've already set out. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I think that is all of them. Um, if anyone does have any more questions, um, I'll be sending a follow up email after the session. Um, well, actually, once I've edited the recording to make it nice, I'll send it to you all. Um, and you can ask any questions following that email um, or find us on Twitter or LinkedIn as well. So thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Suzanne and Ellie for doing a great job. Um, and we hope to see you all at a webinar soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.